Hello friends. It is wonderful to be worshiping with you as we continue in this season of Easter, celebrating the risen Christ. In this unusual time, we are finding ways to worship together while we are practicing social distancing to care for ourselves and the people in our community. Please keep, keep checking our Facebook page and your email for updates about our church's plans for worship. If you haven't already signed up for our text alerts, now would be a great time to do so. All you have to do is send a text to the number 81010 with the message at Beulah UMC. While we are apart, offering can be given by mailing a check, setting up bill pay through your bank, or online through our website or Facebook. We thank you for your continued generosity. Let us begin our service today, as we do every week, by lighting a candle to remind us that Christ is present with us. If you have a candle at home, I encourage you to light it as we enter into this time of worship. Will you join with me in our call to worship, which includes Psalm 104. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. When you send forth your spirit, you renew the face of the ground. May God's glory endure forever. Alleluia. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever And the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing. And the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known I'd stay in the garden with him Though the night around me be falling, but he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, 
this time, we usually pass the peace. As we work to find ways to stay connected in this time apart, let us take a moment to encourage and check in on a friend. Perhaps this week you might try reaching out to someone whom uh, you would not usually communicate with. This is an opportunity to encourage and connect with all of our community. You could send a text to them or write a comment on this video. May God's peace be with each of you. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross, but in blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, for we'll walk by his side in the way. <clears throat> what he says we will do, where he ends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. As we go to God in prayer this morning, you are invited to share your prayer requests via email by sending me a message or by commenting on this video. If prayer requests arise during the week, you are welcome to email or call the church office or me directly. Let us pray. Almighty God, Jesus our risen Lord was made known to the disciples in the breaking of the bread. Open the eyes of our hearts that we may recognize his presence and declare with the disciples, the Lord has risen indeed. God of mercy, there is pain in our world, and too often we contribute to that hurt. Forgive us for the times that we have not seen your presence in the people we encounter. Forgive us for the times we have not considered our effects on the world. Help us to recognize the earth as your creation, along with all of the people in it. Lord, we pray this morning for the church throughout the world, that as we celebrate the great 50 days of Easter, we may renew our faith and strengthen our witness. We pray for the governments of the world and the leaders, that they may pay attention to the needs of all of their citizens. We pray for our planet, that all people may be good stewards of its resources and share in its abundance. We pray for the poor and the stranger, that they may receive a place of refuge and hope. 
We pray for the sick and those in distress, especially those affected by COVID-19, that they may find healing for their pain and be restored to fullness of life. We pray for our neighbors, that we may live together in peace and share our resources. We pray for the teachers, delivery and postal workers, and those who work in hospitals, restaurants, grocery stores, and pharmacies. God of all creation, you opened the meaning of the scriptures to the disciples on the road to Emmaus and set their hearts ablaze. By the power of your spirit, kindle our hearts as we hear your word proclaimed that we may receive you with joy. We pray all of this in the name of Christ and pray as he taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, Master, let me walk with thee in lowly paths of service free. Tell me thy secret, help me bear the strain of toil, the fret of care. Help me the slow of heart to move by some clear winding word of Teach me the wayward feet to stay and guide them in the homeward way. In hope that sends a shining ray far down the Our scripture this morning is Luke 24, verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. One of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us, they were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. 
Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe that the, that the believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had made known to them, how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue in this Easter season worshiping from our homes. As I mentioned last week, I pondered this unprecedented time and what we are learning as Christians. And I thought about a book by Barbara Brown Taylor entitled An Altar in the World, A Geography of Faith. In her book, Taylor explores the sacred in everyday practices. That as she writes about how we can encounter God in our daily lives at home. This seemed like a perfect guide for us in this season when we are spending a lot of time in our homes. Last week, we considered the practice of waking up and paying attention. We thought about how vital it is to see God's presence even in unexpected places. To realize that God's home isn't the church building, but in all of creation. We recognize the importance of having reverence for God's creation by spending time sitting and paying attention, noticing the people, animals, plants, the warmth of the sun, and the gentle breeze. This week we are going to continue paying attention as we consider the practice of getting dirt between your toes. As we read a few moments ago, the scripture for today describes the walk to Emmaus. It was only a few days after Jesus' death and the disciples were still reeling from all of the events of the week. Two of them were walking together and talking when Jesus joined them, walking alongside them. As I read this passage from Luke this week, along with two chapters from Taylor's book, two aspects stood out to me, incarnation and walking. Let's begin by thinking about incarnation or embodiment. Throughout the passage, we read about the physical aspects of the disciples. The day was nearly done, and so I think we can assume that they may have been tired. They needed to eat. Their hearts were burning. I have read this passage numerous times, but this time I noticed that Luke explicitly tells us they stood still looking sad. These are very normal physical reactions, some of which you may have experienced recently. We also read about Jesus' body in this passage as it reminds us that they did not find his body in the tomb. While we often focus on Jesus' spirit, we must remember that Jesus came to the earth as a human, in bodily form like us. Perhaps the most obvious connection with incarnation in this passage is the disciples' declaration that Jesus had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. 
They finally recognized him as they nourished their bodies and remembered the words from the Last Supper. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Throughout scripture, Jesus focused on the physical needs of those around him. He healed people. He ate with people. He fed 5,000 people. He washed feet. Jesus cared not only for the souls of the people that he encountered, but also for their bodies, for their physical life. It makes sense then that we can encounter God through our embodied life. That is, our actions can be a prayer to God and can teach us something about God. Barbara Brown Taylor explores this idea in the third chapter of her book. As I thought about this, our food bank came to mind. I believe our volunteers and donors are opening themselves to encounter God when they serve by feeding the people in our community. Their actions are a prayer. I think this is partially what Paul meant when he said that we should pray without ceasing. Actions can be an offering and a communion with God. Taylor describes the importance of having gratitude for the body that God gave her. Now this gratitude isn't always easy. We live in a culture that has strong opinions on beauty and attractive bodies, and society lets their opinions be known. It has been an interesting transition for me to begin recording our services. Not only do I stand in my front yard in my robe while my neighbors walk past and wonder what is going on, but then I have to watch myself as I edit the video, adding the images and the music. And then I watch myself again on Sunday morning alongside all of you. As I do so, I'll notice the wind picking up my hair or maybe my robe had one too many folds in the way that I tied the cincher. It's easy to nitpick the imperfections. But perfection is not the purpose. Instead, I try to be grateful. Recognizing and paying attention to our own bodies can remind us of our connection to one another and to God. As I stand and record the services, I think of you all. I anticipate the day when I will get to physically be with you all again. And I am grateful that God has given me the abilities to serve in this way. In one of my favorite passages from this chapter, Taylor writes about physical prayers. One example she describes is doing laundry. She, sh she shares, sometimes when people ask me about my prayer life, I describe hanging laundry on the line. After a day of too much information about almost everything, there is such blessed relief in the weight of wet clothes. Every time I bend down to shake loose a piece of laundry, I smell the grass. I hang each t-shirt like a prayer flag. I add a prayer for the trees from which these clothespins came. Taylor goes on to give other examples such as gardening, cooking, doing dishes, or as chapter four is devoted to, walking. Scripture is full of examples where people are walking. This could be because they didn't have vehicles and so most people had to walk, but I wonder if the gospel writers would have chosen to include such details if walking wasn't also a spiritual practice. Now there are extreme examples of this, such as in Matthew 14 when Jesus walks on water, but there are also examples of Jesus walking just as you or I do. We read in John 11 that Jesus walked in the country near a town called Ephraim. In John 10, the gospel tells us that Jesus was walking in the temple. And in Matthew 4, we read that Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee. And of course, in our scripture today, Jesus and the disciples were walking to Emmaus. 
what can we learn about God by walking? There's an ancient spiritual practice called the labyrinth. Taylor describes it writing, a labyrinth is a kind of maze laid out in a perfect circle with a curling path inside. It includes switchbacks and detours just like life. It has one entrance and it leads to one center. Walking the labyrinth requires you to pay attention to the journey, to ponder what God may be teaching you. Of course, sometimes walking a labyrinth isn't an option. I don't believe there is one near here, or there may be physical reasons why you can't walk one. Whatever the case, there are finger labyrinths where you can do the same practice but move your finger along the path instead of walking it. We will share one on our Facebook page that you can print if you are interested in trying this practice. To learn about God by walking, Taylor also recommends walking barefoot. We have biblical examples of this. Last week I mentioned how Moses paid attention when he saw the burning bush. Do you remember what God said next? God said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I followed Taylor's example this past Monday. I took off my shoes in my front yard and I walked, paying attention to the ground, God's holy ground. As I walked, I noticed the grass, which was soft and like a cushion, as it hasn't been cut in a while. I noticed each acorn jabbing into the soles of my feet. I felt the warmth of the road and then the coolness of the water trickling from the storm the day before. As I walked back to my house, I felt the mud between my toes as my feet squelched on the ground. I was thankful for the rain, for our home and our yard, the animals and the shade of the trees. As she writes about walking barefoot, Taylor reminds us of the people who have no choice but to walk barefoot. She continues stating, the spiritual practice of going barefoot can take you halfway around the world and wake you up to your own place in the world all at the same time. It can lead you to love God with your whole self and your neighbor as yourself without leaving your backyard. She also writes that you are welcome to leave your shoes on for the practice of walking as long as you are on the earth and you know it. This past Wednesday was Earth Day, a day of awareness of our responsibility to be good stewards of God's world. And so this week, I encourage you to practice getting dirt between your toes. Pay attention to the ground beneath your feet, whether or not you choose to do so with shoes on. Remember that a big part of Jesus's ministry was paying attention to the physical needs of the people around him. Let us do the same, paying attention to our bodies and the lives of the people around us. Be grateful. As the scripture says in 1 Thessalonians, give thanks in all circumstances. May this practice help you notice the altars of the world, connecting you with creation and the people around you. Alleluia. Amen. Will you receive this benediction? Go from this time of worship, getting dirt between your toes as you remember the incarnational nature of Jesus' ministry. Alleluia. Amen.